Okay, so uh, our next speaker is going to be Maureen Hansen of Cornell University, who's going to continue the discussions of metabolism in uh, MECFS. Well, I, uh, I think I first met Maureen at one of the MECFS meetings. It might have been the one in London. Uh, <clears throat> and then I saw her get up and tell the researchers what they were doing wrong. And I said, wow, this is, this is, this is a wonderful researcher, because she was absolutely right. <laughs> and uh, so uh, she's totally dedicated to figuring this out. And uh, she's a plant biologist. But she knows a lot about mitochondria, because plants have mitochondria. Um, and so she's another one that uh, I have felt when Maureen says, I'm going to be doing this, and I say, fantastic. Uh, I don't have to do that. Uh, that's not another one of those things that, uh, that she can figure it out, and uh, and, and that's just and that's just certainly great. Now that doesn't happen with all researchers. Some I, uh, some of the researchers I I know, and they say, "Well, we're going to do this," and I say, "Oh crap, uh, we're going to have to repeat it." Um, <laughs> <laughs> and so uh, it's really really wonderful to have some people like like Marine Hansen uh, in this field. She's she's super. Thank you, Marine. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so uh, I, I'm here representing not plant biology, but the center that I direct at Cornell uh, called the Center for Enervating Neuroimmune Disease. Uh, that's actually my favorite name for the disease we know as MECFS. Uh, until we come to the final name that this disease should be, uh, I'm using this one. Now, we have a center that uh, is in, uh, in Ithaca, New York, at Cornell's uh, school in Ithaca. We also have our medical college that's in Manhattan, New York. And there are labs at, at uh, uh, both places that are part of our center. Uh, today, though, I'm only going to be talking about research ongoing in my own lab. And I want to uh, start out by thanking my lab members who are working on the disease. I have two postdoctoral associates and three graduate students who are actively studying the disease. I'm only going to be talking about one of the several projects that they're working on. My lab actually does a lot of molecular genetics, uh, and, and this uh, talk on metabolism is sort of a venture into biochemistry uh, that uh, uh, is not one that we have uh, done in the past. So our ongoing research concerning metabolism, there's two aspects to it. One is metabolite profiling, which is a lot of biochemistry. Another one is more cell biology, looking at cell metabolism, combination of cell biology and biochemistry. I'm not going to talk about that last project. I don't have time, uh, but uh, I did briefly speak about it last time when, uh, when I gave a talk here. So the metabolite profiling that we're doing uh, is uh, by having a collaboration with Susan Levine, a well-known MECFS physician in Manhattan, New York. Uh, and we have to thank her patients who were willing to donate blood for this study. The data analysis has been done by Arnaud Germain in my lab, as well as uh, David Rupert, who is a statistician who's been working with us. And this work was funded by the Solve MECFS initiative and uh, partly by NIH. I'd just like to briefly introduce you to uh, the uh, question of metabolites in your body. There is an excellent uh, Canadian uh, human metabolome database uh, that has gathered together all of the metabolites that has been uh, either identified or predicted in humans. There's quite a number there. And, he, and in your blood, your serum, there's, there, in this room, we probably have 25,000 metabolites uh, circulating. Uh, obviously, it's very difficult to examine 25,000 metabolites. In fact, the typical metabolite studies actually analyze and identify only a fraction of this human metabolome. Of course, many of the metabolites that are analyzed are the ones that are mo more common and more abundant in your blood and therefore more important than some of the other ones. But the numbers of metabolites that are identified depends on the methods that are used, how they're separated, and how they're analyzed. So different studies will give you different results depending on what, uh, what you, how you're analyzing the data. 
So the uh, source and type and handling of samples varies between different studies. Now most of us are able to age and gender match our patients and our controls, but it's often very difficult, especially with uh, this patient group, to regulate the time after they've eaten, their diet, all the medicines that, uh, the various medicines that people take, and also, of course, where you live and, and other aspects of dem the demographics. There, we, different groups collect different types of samples in different collection tubes, and you might collect serum versus plasma. Then you have to transport the samples and then store them be, uh, before you analyze them usually. And then the extraction methods vary between labs. So you could imagine that there would be a lot of difference in the different studies that have been done on metabolites. But in fact, the metabolomic studies of MECFS are actually largely consistent. There are alterations in energy metabolism, the Krebs cycle, citric acid cycle, as uh, it's known. There's disturbances in fatty acid and lipid metabolism and purine metabolism. And the metabolites are able to distinguish patients from controls with really quite high specificity, despite all of these differences. So our first metabolomic study was a very small one, which we analyzed uh, only 361 metabolites using the uh, uh, technique of a, a colleague who was generous enough to allow us to run samples on his machine. And uh, we identified 33 metabolites that were significantly different. Those pathways that were affected were fat metabolism, energy and sugar metabolism, and amino acid and purine metabolism, which you've heard about already earlier today. And in that particular study, 29 of the 33 metabolites were lower in the cases than controls, and there was greater variation in the patients. <coughs> So we now have a new study, another small, fairly small study with 19 healthy controls and 32 patients. Uh, again, we used all female patients to have a little more uh, consistency between the sort of person who was analyzed. Their age uh, uh, was uh, the same and their body mass index was also about the same in this, in this group. We used the, this time we used the company Metabolon to do the analysis. And they were capable of analyzing and identifying 832 metabolites in plasma. And they grouped these metabolites into eight super pathways. And you can see there are lipids, amino acids, uh, xenobiotics, uh, nucleotides, energy, all, all these different uh, super pathways were uh, analyzed. So we identified eight metabolites corresponding to four of the super pathways at different levels between patients and controls. Uh, three of these are cofactors. One of them is involved in energy metabolism. Three of them are nucleotides. And one of them is a peptide. What's interesting, though, is even though we identify different actual chemicals and some of the other uh, uh, people have identified in their studies, what's important is what pathways these different metabolites belong to. So even if one group identifies one a set of metabolites and another group identifies a different set, though sometimes those are in the same pathway and therefore it is the same pathway that's actually affected. Now, you just saw this diagram earlier uh, in our uh, keynote address, the citric acid cycle is affected. And, and if you compare the ratio of the C4 and C5 uh, molecules, it's disturbed in the citric acid cycle. And as I just mentioned, alpha-ketoglutarate, one of the compounds of the, of the citric acid cycle, has a significant difference in level between the patients and the controls. Uh, the other interesting thing about uh, this study is that we can actually predict whether you're a case or a control at the 95% level, level just by looking at, at the levels of 41 metabolites. And uh, that is actually a very good uh, uh, sensitivity and specificity. The ratio of just two metabolites each can identify 86% uh, prediction rate of cases versus controls. And this, these ones that are involved in this, these ratios, again, is fatty acid metabolism. So there, again, seems to be something disturbed about fatty acid metabolism. So how does our new study compare to the other metabolomic studies in MECFS? This diagram shows all of those studies indicating how many metabolites were found, that's what's in those circles, 
whether it was only females who were analyzed, whether it was males who were analyzed, or both males and females. Now, obviously, if we can't really compare our data uh, carefully to, to the female data to the male data, there are known differences. And, and if it was grouped together, as were done in some of these studies, we can't really compare it. But we were able to compare our uh, uh, data to the studies that also uh, separated the, the females from the, uh, the males. So one issue in comparing the uh, metabolites found in different studies is that the nomenclature for these metabolites is different, and it, and it, can, it can be very uh, difficult to know that the, this complex metabolite identified in one study is the same as in your study. But they're using this HMDB database and ID numbers, we could identify a number of metabolites that were the same between our study, uh, our metabolon study uh, that we just did in our old study in 2017, the study done by Navio's group and by Armstrong's group. Uh, so we were able to compare a number of metabolites to see if there was any difference. And you can see that uh, in these experiment, the comparison of our studies to the Armstrong ones, there are some differences. But that is easily explained by the fact that the Armstrong group analyzed serum while we were analyzing plasma. So there's some difference there. But if you look at the comparison of our study with the Navio study and with uh, our earlier study, there's very little difference. So that shows it's actually quite reproducible. <coughs> And that's very comforting since clearly our patient uh, population is very different than the one that was analyzed here in California. So we also asked the question, can we find patient subgroups with respect to metabolite levels? We've heard a lot that uh, there you know, are subgroups and we know that there are subgroups in response to drugs, subgroups in different types of symptoms, et cetera. We used a statistical test to evaluate the hypothesis that the patients could be placed into different subgroups according to their metabolite profiles. And when we did this with our study, our old study and the Navio study, we could not find any subgroups. And with regard to the Armstrong study, it was, again, only two patients that differed uh, from the other patients. And uh, one thing I have to ask Chris again is, is if he's figured out what's different about those two patients uh, that might explain why they were their own little subgroup. So this lack of subgroups, to me, suggests that, it, that the blood metabolomics data could be detecting a fundamental difference between MECFS patients and controls. And the fact that this is very consistent between different uh, groups that have done metabolomic studies is also su suggestive that there could be something fundamental that we are detecting by doing the metabolomics. We also did an experiment. We could only again use the HMDB ID identified uh, uh, compounds, but we compared the four data sets that we had to th 344 disease associated human plasma data sets that this. Uh, uh, Genome uh, Canada uh, group made available. And a number of the conditions that were si significant that correlated with MECFS data sets suggested that patient tissue may be experiencing hypoxia, which is inadequate oxygenation. And we've again heard that uh, theme uh, today, and I think we'll be hearing it more later. So what happens when you have uh, hypoxia? It affects your transcription factors. It causes production of reactive oxygen species, causing <laughs> oxidative stress. This can cause vasoconstriction, <laughs> affecting your circulatory system, which is one feature that maybe uh, is a characteristic of MECFS. So there is a lot of evidence for deficiency in tissue oxygenation in MECFS, and, and the metabolite uh, information is just you know, one now another aspect of this. We know there have been cerebral blow blood flow studies and, that show per, poor circulation to the brain. There are studies showing oxidative stress in the brain. We're going to be hearing more about that this afternoon. There's insufficient oxygen delivery during exercise potentially resulting in post-exertional malaise. There's reduced blood volume. David Bell did a very interesting and unpublished study showing that two-thirds of female and a third of male patients that he analyzed had reduced blood volume. Now, if you look at this diagram, you'll see uh, that, that 
the, the, there's, there's a, a diagram showing a normal hematocrit and a low blood volume of hematocrit, and it's absolutely identical, 42%. But the amount of blood is much lower. And so a patient can go in with low blood volume, have a hematocrit done by their general physician, and it will not detect uh, that they have a low blood volume. It only detects if you have anemia. So the other thing is that some of you are probably experiencing here is when you stand up is blood pooling in your legs. And that it also, of course, restricts your uh, your ox oxygenation when all your blood is in your legs instead of where it belongs. There are also some additional disease set, uh, associated metabolite sets. I just thought I would show one of them since we're talking a lot about fatty acid metabolism. There are these three uh, deficiency diseases. The, this diag the gra diagram I'm showing was drawn not for MECFS but for illustrating these diseases. And you can see that what it says is that your uh, long chain uh, uh, fatty acids or metabolism disrupted, and what does that happen? Little or no energy and health problems. So that sounds very familiar, I think. So we want to find out how metabolites change when the patient condition declines or improves. As I mentioned, there is still a challenge about the fact that healthy people and uh, MECFS uh, patients are very different. They have their own genomics environment, et cetera. And there, there is a, the large number of drugs and supplements and dietary differences that we have to deal with. So we, uh, we want to do the same kind of thing that uh, uh, we, heard, we heard about uh, from Alain. Use the patient as uh, uh, his or her own control. You have a healthy person who undergoes a challenge, and it doesn't really affect them. But you have an a MECFS patient who is already in bad shape. You give them a challenge, and they get worse. And so they are serving as their own control. What did that challenge do to them? Of course, the other thing you so so you can look at the difference in various measures, not just metabolites, but other measures to see what's happened to them. And of course, you can compare the baseline uh, patients as well as the uh, the, uh, base, the baseline controls to the patients as well as the post-challenge patients uh, to the post-challenge uh, controls. So as uh, most of you know, we are using the two-day uh, cardiopulmonary exercise test as a challenge. And the idea is to compare the response of healthy individuals and patients before and after an exercise challenge. And as part of our NIH MECFS uh, uh, NIH funded center, we'll be looking at metabolites, cytokines, doing neuroimaging, uh, the, uh, examining gene expression, and also extracellular vesicle cargo, what's contained in those vesicles and their number and the release. And that, that is a, a project not just in my lab, but in the labs across our center at, uh, in Ithaca and in New York City. But I also want to mention a, another project that is a rare chance, a, a unique opportunity, to compare patients when they're extremely ill and after treatment improves their condition. And the reason this is rare, of course, is that there's very few treatments that improve anyone's condition. But Amplogen, uh, that most of you know is a non-FDA approved drug that uh, can only be obtained through a clinical trial, uh, is a way to improve patients, certain patients' conditions. A subset of patients do respond to amplogen. Uh, Dr. Daniel Peterson at Cimarron Research has a group of patients that he has given amplogen to in the past, and they are known responders. And because of manufacturing problems, these people have been off of amplogen for a year. They've relapsed, they're, much, they're back to their baseline status. And now that they can get amplogen again, we can see and look at these patients at the time that they start out and after they've gotten better. And we can compare these to 26 patients who aren't receiving amplogen who are not getting better. The patients are going to be followed over six months. This has already started. Some of the patients were, had their blood collected at time zero. They'll have blood collected after they've had three months of amplogen, and then after six months of, am of amplogen. And due to the funding of, by a generous donor, we will be able to look at metabolites, cytokines, and gene expression. But importantly, we'll be able to bank this blood so that many different kinds of analyses can be done in the future as well. 
We've labeled hundreds of tubes to, for this exercise challenge study and amplogen restart study. So we have tube labeling parties in my lab. <laughs> uh, we we uh, actually get some undergrads to come in. Uh, I'm, uh, my seat is there too. All of us are, uh, s sit there for an hour and a half labeling hundreds of tubes and then send, send these off to the uh, labs that are at drawing the, and processing the blood, and we'll be making a biobank that can then be used, as I mentioned, for collaborative studies that we hope to do in the future. So I'm going to end here with my summary, and uh, I think since my time is up, I will just leave the summary. I've got one minute. <laughs> okay, so I can maybe read it then. We, we have a new study showing eight metabolites are significantly different. Uh, we um, uh, of the four studies for which we have this data, uh, we, we uh, only have some of the metabolites in the same study identified due to different methods and also the problem of, a, of nomenclature that we have. Uh, like other studies, our metabolite analysis re revealed a disturbance in the TCA cycle. We have levels of 41 metabolites to predict case versus control at 95%. We have very consistent results between all four studies. We don't have evidence for subgroups, and that really gets us excited that we could be looking at a fundamental difference between patients and controls. And one of the hypotheses uh, is reduced tissue oxygenation in patients, as well as problems in utilizing fatty acids, which other groups have also found in their studies. Thank you.